Welcome, everybody. I don't know what to welcome you to. Uh, this isn't a regular podcast series that we do, but uh, three of us thought we'd get together and talk a little covenant theology here. Uh, I am joined with, uh, I'm Brandon Adams. Um, I am a sinner saved by grace, and uh, I've got a blog that writes about covenant theology quite a bit, and I help maintain the 1689federalism.com website. Uh, hopefully, we will. Be doing some more with that in the future. It's been a little dormant, but uh, Lord willing, we'll be able to do mm-hmm. some more with that. I'm joined here with uh, Sam Branahan and Richard Barcelos. They are also sinners saved by the blood of Christ. Mm-hmm. They are also pastors and scholars. So Sam has written his dissertation on the historical covenant theology of 17th century particular Baptist. Uh, he's also written... Um, a uh, positive exposition from Scripture of Baptist Covenant Theology, and a ton of other stuff. And then Rich has did his dissertation on comparing John Owen and Gerhardus Voss's biblical theology, which is relevant for this discussion. Uh, he has written um, a book called The Lord's Supper, uh, sorry, More Than a Memory, The Lord's Supper is a Means of Grace. Did I get the title right? I think so. (laughs) Uh, And he also lectures on hermeneutics at uh, various seminaries. Uh, Welcome, Sam and Rich. Thanks, Brandon. It's good to be here. Let's pray real quick and we can dive in. Uh, Father, we just thank you for this opportunity to uh, gather together here over the interwebs and uh, put our minds together and discuss your word. We ask that you would bless our time together. You would give us clarity of thought, um, that by your spirit you would illuminate our minds to properly understand your word. Uh, Give us wisdom to understand and apply it in all its interconnected glory. Uh, We ask that you bless our time here, that it it would be a blessing and edify others, and that it would uh, be a means of of furthering and creating greater unity uh, with uh, our brothers whom we disagree with. Father, we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So the the primary purpose here, or um, what what instigated this conversation, was uh, a variety of episodes of Christ the Center on Reform Forum uh, that they've done over a few years. Um, they did a couple with uh, Jeremy Boothby, who was working on a master's thesis on the Book of Hebrews as it relates to typology, covenant theology, with a particular focus on um, 1689 federalism. So they've done a few episodes there. And then more recently, probably four months ago or so, um, they did another episode with uh, Carlton Wynn. And I apologize, I forget the other guest name, Will, I forget his last name, um, professors at RTS. And their focus in that episode was on uh, Jeremiah 31, as it relates to typology, uh, subservient covenant theology, and and John Owen. And that was, let's see, Christ the Center, I'll have links to it, episode 736. So that'll that'll be our primary focus today. Um, Before we we dive into uh, our outline here, Sam and Rich, do you have any general comments or thoughts about uh, those episodes? I listened to them, and I appreciated... um... The charitable tone, you know, that's something that gets talked about from time to time is, is tone, and it's, it's important. It's not everything, but it's important, and I appreciated their um, clear desire to understand the views that they were interacting with, as well as to represent them fairly. Obviously, our response is trying to further that understanding and further that interaction, but um, it, it seemed like it was a, a very positive invitation um, to interaction, and I, I just appreciated the way that they went about it, um, and I hope that we can in, in many ways emulate or reciprocate uh, the way in which they conducted themselves in the, in the interview or in the podcast and the way that they discussed it. Would you say they were winsome? I would. I believe that they, <laughs> they were clear on things that they criticized, uh, but they were also asking questions saying please explain this to me it doesn't make sense um yeah so i appreciated that yeah i i I did too those guys they're good guys and it sounds like they've read read some material so i appreciate that and 
and they, they have questions. So that's one reason why we're here today, I guess. Yeah. And we will, we will do our best to answer those questions, um, and interacting with them a bit. It's, um, this is a very nuanced topic. It's a very intricate topic and hopefully this podcast will help. Um, but I do think that, uh, what would be most helpful moving forward would be to actually get our, get us all together, um, to discuss these issues, uh, face to face, at least, at least digitally, um, be able to talk back and forth and answer questions and clarify. I think that would be very helpful at this point. So maybe down the road, uh, that would be, that would be possible. Uh, I forgot to mention, uh, thank you for everybody who chipped in a few bucks to get some podcast mics here. We got, got Sam, uh, set up there with the, uh, if anybody's interested, that's the Fifony or Fifine, however you pronounce it. Uh, it's a very affordable, uh, podcast mic there. And then, um, we, Amazon didn't deliver a couple of adapters for Rich, so we didn't get that, uh, mic up and running, but we will get those adapters to him so that, uh, he'll be able to use those in the future. Um, so to, to get us started here, I thought we could, um, start out by just explaining, uh, briefly, um, or not so briefly our understanding of, of the old covenant. Um, much of the episodes there focused on the salvation of Old Testament saints as it relates to typology. So we're going to table that for just a moment and uh, try to establish and set up what we understand the Old Covenant to be in and of itself. So we would say that, um, and chime in if you want to articulate it differently, but we would essentially say that the Old Covenant was a typological covenant of works for temporal life and blessing in the typological holy land of Canaan. And it was conditioned upon the outward obedience to Mosaic law. That sound accurate? All right. So Do this and live in Canaan. But on a subservient view, and I've heard uh, our brother Lane say this uh, a couple times, but if the function of the commands of the Mosaic Covenant were, were to evoke Christless, graceless, bootstrapped obedience for an extended tenure in the land, then how in the world did the nation of Israel survive one millisecond in the land right. uh, after entering? Or yeah. even get to the land. Or even get to <laughs> the land, because a true covenant of works. Mm-hmm. It's not even oriented to eternal life, but just any blessing whatsoever is automatically violated the moment it begins mm-hmm. for any mere human who lives after the fall. Would you agree with his description of our understanding of the role of works in relation to the Old Covenant? Do, do we believe that it was conditioned upon... Uh, the same conditions as the Adamic covenant, the uh, perfect, perpetual, personal, entire, and exact obedience to the law of God. Um, Can I say something? I'm going to set this up for Sam, because I I know he's done a a lot of study here. Um, Maybe it would be good if Sam could help us, help articulate or articulate for us. Um, And this is directly connected to what Brandon just said the nature of a typological covenant of works, the relationship it does and does not have with the Adamic covenant of works, and what that might be called and where it comes from, uh, the Baptists toward the end of the 17th century didn't invent it. So maybe Sam can help us with that. I think that'll help stir up my brain. So <clears throat> Dr. Barcelos is bringing up a good point that we understand the Old Covenant, though it is based on obedience or the enjoyment of blessings is based on obedience. Nevertheless, it is not the original covenant of works from Eden um, revived and copy-pasted into Canaan. Um, it has different promises, it has different precepts, and it has different penalties. Uh, and indeed different parties. Um, 
So it is it is republishing in the sense of, in many ways, imitating. Um, it is republishing in the sense of making the curse of the original covenant of works uh, known again in, in, in certain ways. Uh, but it, it is not the original Adamic covenant of works, and it does not function like the original Adamic covenant of works. It demands an obedience that, that can be rendered uh, by even one who is not regenerate, and it also, uh, we'll, we'll come back to this, but it also provides a means of reconciliation mm-hmm. uh, within itself. And so when I say it provides the, or excuse me, it, it commands an obedience that an unregenerate person can, can offer, what I mean is, for example, when God says, uh, go in and take the land, um, those who go in and take the land uh, are, are fighting, uh, and they're fighting on in the name of God, and, and God is fighting for them, and God is fighting through them, but the whole nation can go in and go up to war. It is not just the regenerate who, who go to war. And so when God commands the Israelites to take the land and then to live in the land, uh, the, the things that he commands them to do are things that even an unregenerate person can, can offer. Now, because they're not regenerate, they're not going to do it perfectly, but there was a sacrificial system that was in place uh, in order to um, in order to restore them to a ceremonial purity, which we'll come back to that. But we have to notice that this begins not just with Moses, this begins mm-hmm. with, with Abraham. In Genesis 17, as, as for you, uh, God says to Abraham, you and your offspring after you, you must keep, you must guard my covenant. And then circumcision is instituted and the one who rejects circumcision, the one who says, I will not be circumcised, the one who contemns uh, the ordinance of circumcision, it, is, it says, is broken off, is cut off from the covenant and will not enjoy the blessings. So just as circumcision could be applied to, to all of the Israelites according to the flesh, uh, there was an obedience that followed from that that they could offer and, and give to God. And some of the, we may come back to this later, but some of the accusations against them that they did not believe and therefore they were they were failed to enjoy some blessings that's not talking about a saving faith that's right. talking about trusting that what god has promised to do he will do so for example the land joshua and caleb say if god has promised this land to us he will give it to us so we should go and fight we should go and invade because god has promised it and we believe the god who has promised and covenanted this land to us by our father abraham uh, and and when, so, therefore, when sorry, the, go ahead. When the Israelites left Egypt, it says that they believed God. They, right. they trusted they, they Him think, and 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 left right. Egypt. It doesn't mean they had saving faith in Christ. It means they believed what God said about their deliverance from Egypt and trusted in Him and left. At least at that particular moment. Right. So, what we're beginning to develop here is an understanding of the role of phrases like belief or phrases like uh, obey in the context, in the original historical context of the Old Covenant. And so if we look at the Old Covenant and we say, uh, this is demanding Christless, graceless, bootstrapped obedience, um, it's just, it's a bad comparison to -to one-to-one analogize the the Edenic Covenant of Works and the the Canaan Covenant of Works or the Mosaic Covenant of Works. They're, They're distinct things with distinct contexts, distinct parties, promises, uh, precepts, and and penalties. And so we have to look at the nature of obedience in the Mosaic Covenant and realize that it was something that could be offered uh, by unregenerate persons, and also that there was a means of reconciliation for them within that system. So, uh, subservient coven- covenant is something they brought up and and push back on what what you're describing is is would it fit within that category that the mosaic covenant is a subservient covenant to something else or of something else absolutely and that's certainly where we're driving is that the mosaic covenant is not an end in itself uh, but a means to an end Uh, that the subservient covenant not only does it portray or republish um, or point back to the Adamic covenant of works, uh, 
but it also points forward and is preparatory unto um, Jesus Christ and the covenant of grace, the new covenant that he will inaugurate and bring to the world. And so the, the law, uh, it's, it's telos, its end, uh, is not just life in Canaan, but rather to, to bring sinners to Jesus Christ and to bring history uh, to Jesus Christ. And that, of course, begins with Abraham, not just with, with Moses. So yes, the subservient covenant view uh, is very much the way that I would understand the old covenant um, and we'll, I'd like, we'll come back to historical theology later on and, and discuss the, the specific beliefs of those who held the subservient covenant view uh, in the 17th century and how they're useful and uh, illustrative for what we believe today. But right, right now, I think it's helpful to come back to the old covenant uh, we've talked about its obedience as something that could be rendered by the whole by the whole nation, but then now speak specifically about the function of the sacrificial system and the the use uh, of it and what it actually accomplished. Yeah, real quick before we jump into that, let me play one more clip from them. So, real quick for context, so what Wynn described initially was what the OPC report. Uh, summarized as the subservient covenant view that it was upon the same condition as the Adamic covenant of works in the garden. Um, I don't think that's an accurate representation of the subservient covenant view. Um, wow. They they quote uh, or they I, I've emailed them about tried to try to talk to tip them about it a little bit and thankfully I think that's why why Camden follows up here with what he does. Um, but they cite uh, Thomas Goodwin for instance as evidence of that. But uh, we'll we'll include. Uh, a link in the show notes to a section from Goodwin that you can read where he talks about the the uh, condition there of the subservient covenant being uh, outward um, uh, outward obedience to the law, as, as we'll discuss in here a little bit. Um, so Camden's correction here is, is appreciated uh, based on follow-up we've had with him. So I'll let, let you hear what he says here. So if that's the case, um, let's let's study or discuss very briefly a similar type of subservient view, view, but one where the type of obedience that needs to be offered is qualified differently. Okay. What about those who may suggest that the obedience required um, is not a type of a condign merit, um, even an, an ex pacto condign type of merit? So it's not substantially the same as what Adam was required uh, to offer, uh, even Adam's obedience didn't earn anything before God, other than God establishing the terms in the covenant. So we want to make sure no one misunderstands me there. But what about those who would say we have here an arrangement in which this is substantially a covenant of works, but it's qualified, kind of, and the type of obedience that needed to be offered by Israel was an outward, external obedience, maybe even the type of obedience that could be offered by an unbeliever, formally like a Pharisee type of obedience. Yeah. And then if somebody slipped up, they could also um, remedy their situation with the outward observance of the sacrificial forms, which were also provided to provide restoration and forgiveness. Although it would be an outward external form of restoration and forgiveness in the land. Okay. I think I've got at least two things to say to that. And Will, I want to hear what you have to say. Number one... Behind the entire mosaic economy is the reality of creation and the original covenant of works. And we know, I hope we know, that at the core of that religious relation compounded by the covenant condescension of God is face-to-face -face fellowship from the heart. Mm -hmm. So from the very beginning of creation, mm -hmm. God only and always demands pure, perfect, heart-level obedience. Your, your banner of truthing before my eyes right now. <laughs> so <laughs> the notion that God would demand only outward, unbelieving, Christless, bootstrap, yeah. formal obedience would contravene the very essence mm -hmm. of God's relationship with rational creatures. When has this ever been encouraged? Are we denying that God demands perfect, 
obedience from the heart from Israelites as image bearers? No, certainly not. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, uh, and with all your mind. But we are distinguishing um, the function of the obedience in the Old Covenant uh, from that of the function of obedience for believers uh, and what they were able to offer uh, and what was acceptable uh, according to the Old Covenant. And their outward obedience is matched by an outward forgiveness in the sacrificial system. The temporal blessings uniquely offered by the Old Covenant are what are Correct. conditioned by that outward obedience. It's not that God has suddenly stopped his demand upon the Israelites as image bearers and saying, you no longer need to obey me perfectly from the heart as established at creation as image bearers. He's not pausing that and saying, now you only have to obey outwardly to the letter. Instead, he is giving them some unique blessings not offered to other people in the world. He's established a unique relationship with them, giving them these outward blessings in the outward holy land, and he's conditioned those unique blessings upon outward obedience to the law. Right, and I, I think that let's not be abstract here. Let's be concrete. Th this is what we mean. Uh, what God demands of the Israelites is ceremonial purity. He says, you will worship me. You will worship only me. You will worship me in the way that I have established and ordained and instituted in the places that I have established and ordained and instituted. And so God demands their loyalty. He demands their worship. He demands that they love him and serve him and obey him. And that is part of the old covenant. So if we ever say, you know, there's sort of this outward arrangement of obedience that really just doesn't, doesn't matter, it's not important, it's not of the heart, that, that's not what we're talking about. God is demanding that they be his people according to the flesh. Abraham and his offspring, all of them marked by circumcision, uh, they are his people and they are given Canaan and they are to live there and worship God. And so the, the law of Moses, uh, it not only organizes, but it also strictly um, determines the way in which they are to worship God and the way in which they are to be holy. If you do this, you are holy. If you do not do this, you are unholy. Or if you do this, you are unholy. And so the holy versus unholy laws of the, of the Old Testament, of the, the law of Moses, that's what we're talking about. An outward obedience and an outward holiness or a ceremonial holiness. If you touch this thing, you are unholy. If you eat this thing, you are unholy according to the flesh. And the sacrifices restore that outward ceremonial holiness. So if we think about the kings, the Davidic kings, as well as the, the Sumerian kings or the, the northern kingdom kings, and if we think about the exile, the curses that are called down upon them from Deuteronomy and applied to them that remove them from the land, what determines the goodness or badness of a king and what determines tenure in the land uh, is whether or not they are maintaining an outward ceremonial purity, whether or not they are maintaining a, a, the holiness that the old covenant demands of them. And so because they are not worshiping God correctly, because they are offering polluted sacrifices, because they are perverting justice, all of these things are the reasons why God pours out the curses upon them. So when we say outward obedience, we're talking about maintain justice in the land, maintain purity in the ceremonial system, the, the worship that God has instituted for you and for this people. And th that's, I think, a much better path forward than saying, than contrasting, or it's, it's better to say that than if we just say God demands outward obedience, of course, that, that kind of phraseology is going to be liable to a great deal of criticism. But if we get specific about what God commands in the Old Covenant, it's, it's to some degree a measure of just reading it off the page. Okay, God demands this holiness. God demands this justice in the land. And when you pervert that justice and when you pervert that holiness, then God will discipline you and curse you and cast you out of the land, which of course he did. So, so that's what we're saying. And we're saying that all of the Israelites could do that which was just in the land, and all of the Israelites could do that which was ceremonial pure and ceremonially holy in the land. And just a, a quick comment there. So in the OPC report and republication, they make a great deal of emphasis upon the idea that no work 
could ever be acceptable before God unless it was done in union with Christ and spirit wrought obedience. Um, so they would say exactly what you described is impossible for a sinner. They can't do anything that would ever please God. And I think to that we would say, first of all, we have the, the Noahic covenant that is stabilizing all of creation upon this, this common grace platform. Um, God is giving common grace benefits to, to all of these creatures that don't deserve it. He's allowing them to live and eat and breathe. And upon that platform, he's established this unique relationship with Israel where he's giving them, we could call it very heightened common grace blessings. He's given abundant food, uh, wonderful land, victory and wars. And on that platform of common grace, he's saying these uh, unique rewards are uh, conditioned upon outward obedience to the law. We're not saying that they were... Um, uh, they were pleasing to God in and of themselves. We're saying that they simply met the condition for uh, reward that he offered. Which would be what what uh, Brother Camden mentioned of ex pacto merit. It, yep. it, this allows you to stay in the land because God has arranged it that way covenantally. Uh, he has given you the land freely as a child of Abraham, but he demands your justice and ceremonial purity to remain in the land uh, which so long as you maintain, you retain that blessing. Uh, and so that is according to God's design and according to God's covenant, which he is free to make uh, with man as he pleases. Uh, that le- You mentioned uh, the, the pollution of the ceremonies here. This leads us into the next clip here with him real quick. The sure. thing I would say is that that kind of obedience is precisely what the prophets chastise the nation for, <laughs> yeah. and, and it is the grounds for which they eventually get sent into exile. The problem with Old Testament Israel was that they were carrying on a resemblance of obedience, sacrificing to God while their hearts were far from Him. And to enshrine that as the very design of the Old Covenant I think, misses the greatest sin of Israel and works it into the original design of the Mosaic Covenant itself. Mm -hmm. So on his view, um, the reason they were sent into exile is because they failed to have saving faith in Christ. He articulates it as they did obey outwardly according to the letter of the law, but they didn't have saving faith in Christ, therefore they were exiled. Uh, Would you agree with that? understanding of the biblical data regarding the exile? If that's what he meant, I would not uh, agree. I would agree with him that to, to, to say that, you know, a just going through the motions of the Mosaic Covenant uh, is, is sufficient, that that is indeed um, criticized by the prophets, uh, that, that God, God will not accept their sacrifices because they do not love him, because they pervert justice uh, in the land and such things. But if, if what he is saying is that saving faith is what is criticized and is the cause of their exile, then, then surely I would disagree with that. Yeah, they mention uh, a little bit later there, uh, Jeremiah 7, um, as, as a response um, saying that, uh, that they were exiled exactly for what he said. So they, they disobeyed and they brought their sacrifices and that wasn't good enough and they, they were exiled. Um, if you look at the context there, Jeremiah 7 specifically says that the temple was polluted, that they had set up idols inside the temple. Um, if that's right, the, the case... the problem is not the sacrificial then, system. The problem is the way that they're polluting and perverting it. They're bringing the lame animals. They're, they're bringing not the best of the flock. They're bringing things that are not really according to God's design and God's purpose. And, of course, God always said, I desire obedience, not sacrifice. Obe- to obey is better than sacrifice. And the people were thinking, well, why obey? We can just sacrifice. And then they were offering polluted sacrifices. So it's not so much the sacrificial system that's the problem. It's the, the people even misunderstanding the sacrificial system and the, the obedience that God wants from them uh, as his his special and peculiar people to whom he has given Canaan uh, and of whom he demands justice and holiness. If we want to say that uh, the sacrificial system was able to forgive ceremonial and outward sin, um, we have to recognize how that 
sacrifice worked, Leviticus 18 on the Day of Atonement refers to it as making atonement for the holy place. So it wasn't just the people, but the holy place had to be cleansed. And uh, Jeremiah 7 says, uh, the sons of Judah have done evil in my sight, declares the Lord. They have set their detestable things in the house that is called by my name to defile it. So it's not even, they were not even offering sacrifice according to the law. They weren't, they were not obeying to the letter of the law. They were disobeying the the atonement could not atone because they were not offering it according to the law. Which is a violation of the second commandment, you know, that's idolatry. And it also, Brandon, it's a good point because it, think about Josiah, when the Israelites purify their worship, those are the kings that are marked as good. This person did what was right in the eyes of the Lord, according to all the deeds of his father, David. Who are the kings that get that commendation? It's the ones who purify the worship. It's not the ones who have nothing to do with, with the sacrificial system. It's the ones who remove the idols from the temple, the ones who remove the Asherah poles and the high places and the priests of Baal, etc., cetera, etc., cetera. the ones who remove the idolatry of the land and lead the people in uh, pure worship, in right worship. Those ones are not exiled. Those ones are not punished. Those ones are not cursed. Rather, they are rewarded and they are blessed and they are allowed to remain in the land. Josiah, I won't exile the people during your time because you have loved me and you have purified the worship of the land. This will not take place in your generation, but in, but in the future, et cetera. So it, it's a way to test our understanding of the old covenant is to see what God rewarded, to see what God responded to. It was the kings and the people under the leadership of the kings who purified the temple and purified the worship of the land those ones uh, received God's blessing and his protection in the covenant. And I, I forgot to mention this earlier, but I want to throw it in there quickly. So the, the question is, well, even when they did break it, why did they get to stay in the land for so long? And um, I would just refer back to the covenant of circumcision. Um, it, God promised that, uh, he made several promises to Abraham, and uh, until those promises were fulfilled, God was long-suffering towards Israel. So it was a grace that undergirded um, and withheld the Old Covenant curses until those promises were fulfilled. So once Israel fully inhabits the land, uh, and it says Israel was as numerous as the stars of heaven at the dedication of the temple, Solomon mentioned those things, and immediately after that, um, the kingdom is split in two, and ten tribes are cast off and cursed and never heard from again. And then Judah isn't... Um, doesn't experience the full brunt of Old Covenant curses until after the final Abrahamic promise that the birth of Christ is fulfilled. So when Moses appeal, intercedes for Israel and appeals to the promise that God made to Abraham, um, that is what uh, withheld the Old Covenant curses from, from being poured out, in my understanding. Um, this final clip here is going to get us into the main focus of, of typology and its, and its function. Um, or, or I should say the sacrificial system in and of itself, it, its function. So um, let's see. here. And so a subservient view has to assign, this is another problem, a particular function to all of these things mm -hmm. that is devoid of Christ. And once we evacuate the very presence of Christ, we've just done away with the entire point of the mosaic economy. And it gets back to the whole mm -hmm. heavenly patterning aspect that we were talking about earlier. What's being patterned? in the Old Testament types, well, it's Christ himself, right? And, and so the, the integration of these things and how Christ is actually communicated is the whole point. You know, Voss's triangle and this is teaching the Epistle of the Hebrews illustrates that perfectly. So we'll get into some of that, the, tri the triangle and stuff with Voss a little bit later, but um, he, he highlights an important point there. If we're saying this is not just if we're saying the entire point of the Mosaic econ economy is not simply to save Old Testament saints, we must assign some function for it aside from that. There must be some function that it serves in and of itself. Um, he would see that as a problem. We would say, no, that's, that's recognizing the Old Covenant in and of itself. It's served a function. The sacrifice has served a function. Um, so in that sense, we wouldn't say that they were bare forms, right? They served um, 
they, they serve to function in their own regard. And so I think we've talked about that a little bit. Um, you, you mentioned um, there's a f- few other types maybe we could go through and just show what, what they, if we want to look at, uh, Sam, you've, you've talked about in other um, lectures and stuff, the idea of two-tier typology. Um, and that's the idea that, that the types function on two different levels, one with reference to Christ and another in and of the, themselves on their own level. So if we could focus a little bit just on that first level, that first tier, what did these, what was the function of these things in and of themselves? Right. So when we're dealing with two tier typology, uh, types have their own initial, original, historical level of significance. They're, they have their own reality in and of themselves, and they serve their own function and purpose in and of themselves in their own day. And in order to appreciate typology, you have to start there and, and appreciate the type in its original context, which the symbolism there then becomes what makes it a, a type of, a, of an antitype, that second level, greater and other than itself. So, for example, um, the sacrificial system is the, the easiest example because it's the most developed and studied by the scriptures themselves, especially in the book of Hebrews. And in the book of Hebrews, we are told that the sacrifices, they purify the flesh, uh, that these things, uh, these offerings are used for the purification of the flesh. And so when we go back to Leviticus or Exodus, and any time that the sacrificial system is either instituted or discussed in the law of Moses, the the sacrifices, whether they were the the regular, the daily, the regular, or the, the day of atonement sacrifice, it uses again and again expressions that say, and their sins shall be forgiven, or atonement shall be made. Their sins shall be forgiven, atonement shall be made. Uh, and the, the writer to the Hebrews says, this is purification of the flesh. And these things, these sacrifices do not reach to the conscience. They do not purify the conscience. They do not perfect the conscience. In fact, there's a reminder of sins built into these things. Now, this means that we have to realize that animal blood does forgive sins. Animal blood does purify the flesh, but it means I have touched an unclean thing. I have disobeyed the law of Moses. I am now unclean relative to the law of Moses. I am now unclean according to the flesh. And animal blood will forgive those sins against the Mosaic law. Animal blood will make atonement for me according to the Mosaic law. Uh, and so it's, if, it, it's kind of a strange thing where the writer to the Hebrews says, animal blood does not forgive sins. Animal blood cannot forgive sins. And what, it, what the writer means is in the way that Christ's blood has. So this is where we get that two-tier typology. The first level, the first tier is the type in its original historical context. The sacrifices take away sins. The animal blood takes away sins according to the flesh, or it purifies the flesh, but it cannot reach to the heart. It cannot give you what we might call heavenly forgiveness, forgiveness in the court of heaven. Whereas only Christ's blood can do that, and that's the second tier, that's the anti-typical level, that's the final, the, the, the true, the ultimate uh, reality that the sacrifices are a picture of. So if you call the sacrifices a bare form, we would say, well, the sacrifices have their own function and their own purpose and their own significance in their own context, namely to purify the flesh, which is what the scriptures say they do, which is what Leviticus and Exodus say that they do, and indeed they did do. Now, we can take that understanding of typology, and it it applies to the rest of the types of the Old Testament. So if you look at, for example, the Passover lamb, we would all say this is a picture, this is a type of Jesus Christ. And yet the the blood of the Passover lamb, which is put on the the lintels and the the doorpost of of their dwellings in Egypt, what did that blood do? What did that blood accomplish? What it accomplished was the passing over of the destroying angel that came through Egypt and struck down the firstborn of of man and beasts. And so we would say that blood had a real function, and it effected something in its own time. And through what it did in its own context, that symbolism points us above and beyond 
to the Jesus Christ, our Passover lamb. This is true of the Red Sea crossing. What is it? It's deliverance from Egypt. It's giving the Israelites an exodus. It's also a picture of something greater and other. Going back to the the uh, Passover lamb, was the efficacy of the blood of that lamb contingent upon saving faith in Christ? No, certainly not. Everyone who is within the household of a of a place with the blood on the on the doorposts received that benefit. Everyone uh, was was safe uh, they, from those. They they had to believe what God warned would happen. They had to believe that there was going to be this curse being poured out on the firstborn in order to sacrifice lamb and put it above their, their doorpost. But they did not have to have saving faith in Christ, as we learned that entire first generation did not. Um, but it was effective in and of itself. Um, so just by way of contrast, in, in some other lectures and maybe interviews, Lane Tipton has said that in, in that um, Passover lamb, Egypt was redeemed. By the blood of Christ, they, Israel was united to the Redeemer. They were re- united to Christ, and they were redeemed out of Egypt by the blood of Christ. And we would say, no, they were redeemed by the blood of this Passover lamb, not the blood of Christ. Which was a picture, a type of the blood of Jesus Christ, of course. So j- not to belabor the point, but it is important to sort of go through examples and, and prove it. Um, we just talked about the Passover lamb, the Red Sea crossing, the manna. Uh, Jesus makes manna a, a, ty- a relation of typology, where the manna in the wilderness gives them life for another day on their way to Canaan, on their way to the promised land. Jesus says of himself, I am the true manna. You'd say, well, that's kind of strange. He's saying, I am what the manna was a picture of. I am the substance of which the manna was a shadow. I am the the ultimate and final heavenly reality. Uh, The serpent that was lifted up. The the point is the manna had its own function. Right. right, right. right. And the serpent that's lifted up, those who looked to it and pleaded with God for mercy uh, because he had instituted that those who do this will receive this benefit, those who looked up at that serpent, they were delivered from the affliction of the, of the fiery serpents and the, the, the terrible wounds that they, that they caused. So looking to that serpent healed their bodies, but it was a picture, the Son of Man must also be lifted up. Uh, and, and of course, then the, that's when you get to the sacrificial system and say, all of these things purify the flesh, restore ceremonial outward holiness for all those who participate rightly uh, according to God's laws in the sacrificial system, but they, that animal blood can never bring you, it can never perfect your conscience, and it can never bring you into the heavenly holy of holies. The animal blood can only bring you into the earthly tabernacle made with hands. Animal blood cannot give you access to the heavenly tabernacle not made with hands. Only the blood of Jesus Christ perfects the conscience. Only the blood of Jesus Christ brings you into that heavenly holy of holies. Uh, and so what, just to keep in mind what we are asserting here and what I believe is in many ways the resolution to what our Reformed Forum brothers are discussing and some of the questions that they ask about our own views is to give a clear expression to two-tier typology that the Old Covenant, in, in, in fact all types, but especially we're speaking of the Old Covenant typology, they had their own initial first level or first tier significance and reality and function. And in my opinion, our, our brothers often skip over that and fail to acknowledge it and fail to appreciate it sufficiently. And so to them, it looks like we're evacuating the, we're, we're making those things, th- that was their word, but to them, it looks like we're making these just bare forms, uh, an empty something that is a, apparently a, a picture of Christ. But we have to realize they're not bare forms. They, they symbolize and they, they grant blessings in their day and in their time that are distinct from the blessings that Jesus Christ brings uh, in himself. Uh, and so typology is, is two-tier typology, this first level, the shadow, and the second, final level, the antitypical level, the, the substance. Can I, uh, can I interject here? You may. Thank you, Lord Brandon. Um, uh, one of the things they're getting at <clears throat> is, is, 
is I think an important issue. And that is, do some of these um, typological, let's just say institutions like the sacrificial system, do they function one way um, horizontally, well, and vertically, but non-redemptive, non-soteriologically, and then on the other hand, can we posit a distinct function for elect believers? Was, was something happening, ordo salutis kind of stuff, for some people who believed the promise, were they receiving, or was, was the occasion of them receiving grace from, from God uh, the participation in the sacrificial system? Yeah, I think that's absolutely good... rich. That's precisely where we're driving. Yeah. So yeah, and and here's an go ahead. No, no, go for it. Okay, well, I was going to say, you know, with reference to typology and whether or not they're merely prospective, looking forward, or can or or also symbolic of real communication conveyance application of redemptive benefits to souls my question is is that true of every single type namely every single type in the old testament both points forward and is also a symbol of a real present redemptive uh, grace reality being experienced by the souls of elect believers and i think we need to be very careful with that because, for instance, the first type that I think most people would agree on would be Adam. Adam was a type of him who was to come. And I think Adam was a type of him who was to come um, in his prelapsarian state. But was Adam also symbolic? Was he receiving the grace of Christ as a type, you know? And then Eve comes on the scene. And if we take our hermeneutical cue from the Apostle Paul, which I think we should, I, I think we would say Eve is a type of the church. Um, but was Eve receiving, was Eve as a type of the church also symbolic of the reception of, you know, ordo salutis type benefits? Um, you know, that's that's before the fall into sin. I don't want to go that way. I have other types before the fall into sin, but we won't discuss them. So I, I think we need to make careful distinctions, not putting all types in the same exact category of both prospective and at least potentially symbolic of the experience of the benefits of the mediator. Yeah, I think that's helpful. Thank you. So as we as we get in just to the question of salvation of Old Testament saints, then um, let's start out by explaining the salvation of, of New Testament saints. Um, there may be slight differences in the way we express this from from our brothers at Reform Forum potentially. So uh, we would say that New Testament saints are saved by and through the New Covenant. And let me know if you agree or disagree here, but we would say that union with Christ, they are saved through union with Christ, and we would say that union with Christ is the new covenant. Uh, the new covenant is our marriage union with our Redeemer, our marriage union with Christ. Would you agree with that? Certainly. The new covenant is how we uh, enter into and participate in the blessings that Jesus Christ has won for us as our head. So to be united to him and to derive from him all the, the grace that he has won for us uh, in covenant is, is indeed the new covenant. And so they may potentially define that differently. It'd be helpful to have back and forth here at this point, but um, th they may, might be more inclined. Um, uh, yeah, Meredith Klein, when I read it, he seems to make a little bit of a... Um, the, the inward outward historically 
Presbyterians would look at uh, the covenant of grace as an inward covenant of grace and an outward covenant of grace. And Klein would tend to push the inward covenant of grace to the covenant of redemption and make the covenant of grace the, the outward covenant of grace. And so kind of bifurcate that a little bit. So just when I hear Camden talk and other guys on Reform Forum talk, I don't hear them talk about the new covenant in terms of union with Christ. I hear them talk about the new covenant in terms of the ordinances and things like that. So um, it may contribute a little bit to, to lack of um, understanding between, between our views, uh, potentially. So, so they would point to, well, I don't want to get into boss's triangle at the moment, but I'll, I'll leave it at that. Just, just explaining what our view is, is that we would say that um, New Testament saints are saved through new covenant union with Christ, and that that covenant is made with us in the effectual call. We, that the effectual call, we could say, is God making the new covenant with us. And from that, we receive the Spirit, we're regenerated, we receive faith, um, forgiveness of sin, sanctification, glorification. Um, and uh, both the Westminster Confession and London Baptist Confession 10.1 and 14.1 talk about salvation comes ordinarily through the ministry of the Word by the Spirit in the effectual call. Uh, so that is, the, that is how we are saved today. Uh, our faith is strengthened by ordinances, uh, but the, the, the salvation is established in the effectual call through the new covenant, which dispenses the ordo salutis benefits of Christ. Any comment we're on not, that? Yeah, we're not denying an internal and external distinction of the covenant. Um, because the, the outward administration is indeed uh, broader than the internal reception of the benefits, you know, which is essentially visible, invisible church language. So we're not, we're not denying that not everyone who receives baptism and not everyone who receives the Lord's Supper uh, is saved. Uh, but we would say that they're, they're false. They're simulating outwardly uh, an inward reality that they don't have. So I just want to be clear that we're not denying an internal external distinction. Right. Um, right. We, we are denying um, an outward membership or that somebody could be a party to the new covenant outwardly. They, only those who are united to Christ are members of or party to the new covenant. Right. They, only those who are united to Christ are truly members of the new covenant. Uh, those who are not are falsely, <laughs> but they are nevertheless accountable for their actions. Certainly, but in terms of uh, as a legal establishment, a legal relationship, um, they are not united to Christ. They don't have a legal covenantal union with Christ. Um, they have an illegal covenant union. <laughs> so we may, we may falsely consider them to be united right. to Christ, um, but, but they are not. Um, so if we take that understanding, that's how New Testament saints are saved. And then we go back and look at Old Testament saints. We would say the same thing. Old Testament saints were saved through new covenant union with Christ, correct? Yes. And uh, the author of Hebrews makes that clear in that he establishes Christ as the mediator of the new covenant. Uh, there is no other way to be saved but through his mediation of, of the new covenant. Um, and we can put some links up there that that's, that's not a distinctive of our view. That's something that's been held across various uh, denominations and schools throughout history. Augustine, Aquinas, uh, the Catechism of the Roman Catholic Church actually states this point, quoting Aquinas, uh, Lutherans affirm it, uh, Baptists affirm it, subservient covenant guys affirm it, and various Westminster guys affirm it, um, Horton, Frame, many others. And, and most, when I explain it in this way, they say, oh yeah, that, that makes sense, we agree. Um, the disagreement then is whether or not the old and new are the same covenant. But what we would call the, the retroactivity of the new covenant, just the fact that Old Testament saints are saved by the new covenant, uh, the work of Christ to come. They participate in that in advance um, of Christ coming to do that work because Christ's promise to do it is, is sure and certain and, <clears throat> excuse me, and guaranteed. 
Um, and like New Testament saints, that relationship with uh, for Old Testament saints' union with Christ is also established in the effectual call uh, by the Word. So the Le- Second London Baptist Confession added chapter 20. Uh, it was not present in the Westminster Confession. Uh, it was first it talks- added by the Savoy Divines and then continued on into our confession. And it ta- I forget the, the chapter heading, but of the gospel call and the extent thereof, some- something along those lines. Uh, anyways, point, uh, paragraph one says, The covenant of works being broken by sin and made unprofitable unto life, God was pleased to give forth the promise of Christ, the seed of the woman, as the means of calling the elect and beginning in them faith and repentance. In this, the, uh, in this promise, the gospel, as to the substance of it, was revealed and is therein effectual for the conversion and salvation of sinners. And it notes Genesis 3.15 and Revelation 13.8. So that, that explains primarily how we would understand the salvation of, of Old Testament saints is through the, uh, the word as a promise of the gospel uh, made effectual to their salvation. Do you have any comment there? No, certainly. And like you said, it's not really a point of, of disagreement. Um, you know, just clarification. Yeah, it's just clarification that the the promise of Christ to come is the the source of salvation throughout history until Christ comes. And, and by the way, the promise of Christ to come predates Abraham and predates the writing of the Old Testament, and its promise made effectual by the Spirit in the souls of some, created true believers in the Christ to come uh, before Abraham and before the Old Testament was written. And I think we can learn that in part from Hebrews chapter 11. There are some people that predate Abraham that seem to be, uh, you know, using New Testament language in Christ. I don't see how there's any other way to be saved except to be somehow, some way, united to Christ and a recipient of his benefits. Yeah, John Owen has a quote that I've used many times, many places, where he says, uh, it is agreed on all part, on all sides, that the promise uh, of Christ and the promise of the grace of Christ was the source of, I'm paraphrasing, was the source of salvation in all history. He says, the Socinians only accepted. <laughs> Everyone agrees, except for Socinians, that the promise of Christ was present in the Old Testament and was the source of salvation uh, in all history until Christ came. How would you say? Uh, Go ahead. I was going to bring up something Brandon had brought up already. In the chapter on saving faith, excuse me, not saving faith. Yes, saving faith. It says the grace of faith whereby the elect are enabled to believe to the saving of their souls is the work of the Spirit of Christ in their hearts and is ordinarily wrought by the ministry of the Word. Now, um, this, is a, this is a churchly confession, so I think they're concentrating on the, the then um, mechanisms or means of grace for the then people of God in the 17th century and, and us subsequent to that. Uh, but if we think about this, before inscripturation, there are believers in the Christ to come. How did they come to Christ? Um, they got a word. The, 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 the promise of Genesis 3.15 must have been uh, traditioned to um, pre-inscripturated, pre-inscripturated people. <laughs> people before the scriptures were written. You know, there were believers in Christ prior to the promise of Christ being written about. How did they get it? They got the word of the promise. I think Adam and Eve were the first to believe it and then pass it on to others. Um, But that's that's fascinating to think about. I don't think the sacrificial system itself, uh, I don't think we should view uh, the mosaic animal sacrificial system as... I guess we could say that, you know, they were visible words 
But when we use that language of visible words, it's usually baptism, the Lord's Supper. But they're not saving ordinances. They don't affect faith. They can enhance faith. They can strengthen faith. Um, so I, I think we need to distinguish there between the promise, <laughs> the communication of information uh, with, um, you know, means of grace. Absolutely. I agree. And I, I think that's, that's very, very important and very helpful. And it's, it's something that was missing from their conversation. It's not necessarily something they would disagree with, but. Um, yeah, I, I don't, I don't think they would necessarily disagree with it. One of my frustrations over the years in reading books, especially biblical theology books by non-Baptists is it's almost like the history of redemption um, starts in Genesis 12 or 15 or 17 or 18 mm -hmm. or 22 or mm -hmm. something like that. And, and, you know, it depends on how we define the history of redemption, because I, I think there's one sense in which the Historia Salutis, the history of redemption, uh, actually predates the writing of the Mosaic uh, Corpus, because God was acting in the world for redemptive purposes before Moses recorded what he did. Um, the history of redemption actually starts at the first revelation of, of the promise of the skull crushing seed of the woman of, of Genesis 3.15. I'd actually go farther. Well, yeah, I would actually go behind the promise in one sense. And this is weird. And you guys would probably go, huh? But I think that the history of redemption was at least being set up in some prelapsarian institutions like marriage, like Adam is a type of Christ. And maybe even plants coming the, out of the ground on the third day, but we'll leave that for another time. <laughs> what? J read John 12. Jesus connects his resurrection with a seed coming up <laughs> out of the ground. And Paul does the same thing in 1 Corinthians 15. You're, 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 you're too strapped with modern hermeneutics, Brandon. <laughs> I, didn't I didn't say, say anything. anything. But you, you, get, you get my point there. Mm -hmm. I forgot what it was, but okay, good. Yeah, you're, you're, it I forgot you, you were <laughs> you were emphasizing that uh, that salvation for Old Testament saints comes through the promise uh, through the Word, um, and and making a point that th there's a difference between uh, Old Covenant sacrifices and then what we would look at as as Lord's Supper and baptism, um, in, in the way they relate to these things. Well, faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of god or christ um we're, we're we're trying to say yeah from the beginning mm -hmm. now in the form of a of a promise uh, in this of the seed of the woman that would demolish the devil I, I i get that but that that promise doesn't stay in that form throughout the entirety of the old testament you know it, it develops but it's all organically related and it's all progressive revelation pointing to some sort of consummation and then you know when paul uses the language uh, in the fullness of time, God sent forth his son, born of a woman. I think they're in a, in a biblically saturated mind. We would immediately go back to Genesis 3.15 and say, ah, here it is. Mm -hmm. You remember uh, in 4.1, Genesis 4.1, Eve says, wow, I've gotten a, a man child, the Lord. It could be translated that way. Mm -hmm. I remember reading, I think it was a Lutheran. It could have been Luther. I'm not sure, I'm not sure but poor woman thought she gave birth to the Messiah. She missed <laughs> the timing. She missed the timing, but she got the substance of the promise right. Yeah. And the, the name of Noah, um, I think the text there refers to uh, the one who will bring us rest. Uh, you know, the idea that they, they are down through these generations looking for the fulfillment of that promise. That's interesting, rest. The one who will bring us rest. I think something, something along those lines. lines. Yeah. <laughs> um, so how, how would we say that types relate to the promise? So the promise is propositional revelation of what is to come. Types, how do they relate to that? Uh, they elaborate upon and illustrate in more detail the promise. Well... Um, I think they certainly can. Um, 
You know what? I think Sam was going to say something. So go ahead, Sam, so I can get my thoughts together here. Well, Paul looks back at the Old Testament and he speaks about the mystery of Christ. Uh, and what he's talking about is that the revelation of all that Christ would do uh, was present in the Old Testament, but it was present in the mode of mystery. So it's revealed, but it's revealed partially, it's revealed obscurely, it's revealed uh, in dark uh, ways. You know, we could, we could add a bunch of adverbs to say kind of the same thing, to say it was revealed mysteriously. Um, there, there's a veil that's over it. And so typology reveals Christ um, not directly, in a sense, but indirectly. It's not, um, so for example, animal sacrifices, it's not this animal is Christ and its blood is Christ's blood because the writer to the Hebrew says, no, it, it can't do what Christ's blood does. But it does tell you God accepts sacrificial victims as to make atonement. God will accept the blood of another, a pure and perfect uh, offering or victim to make atonement. And so that, that is teaching you something. It is, uh, it is affecting purification of the flesh in and of itself, but it's also teaching you something other and greater, that God will accept blood for the remission of sins. This is what God will do. And, it, and so as there is a reminder of sins uh, in the sacrificial system, so it, it pushes subserviently the, the Old Testament saint or the Old Testament Jew to, to look above and beyond the animal sacrificial system to something other and greater. And so it's not that the type in itself uh, accomplishes something, but it points you to Christ who accomplishes something and therefore is a, a means of connection. It is a type. Um, and so therefore, uh, it, it, through mystery, you know, it's not a, a, a direct or an obvious or, or a, a clear portrayal of Jesus Christ, but rather it is nevertheless a portrayal of Jesus Christ and his blood. And so I think that talking about mystery, incorporating Paul's category of mystery into typology is a helpful way of acknowledging that types are absolutely portraying Jesus Christ, but they do it in an obscure, a partial way. And I would recommend um, Benjamin Glad and Greg Beale's book on, on mystery. It's, it's very helpful. Of course, you know, I, I wrote The Mystery of Christ, His Covenant, and His Kingdom, which you could look at. Um, but that's how I understand Paul's use of mystery, and that's how I would understand typology revealing Christ. It does reveal him. Uh, but in a sense, secondarily and indirectly. Yeah, I, I think that the, uh, the New Testament helps us um, with some of the things you were just talking about. For instance, in 1 Peter 1, verses 10 and following, as to this salvation, that would be the salvation that the recipients of Peter's letter were now experiencing, the prophets, who I take to be the writing prophets of the old era, the prophets who prophesied of the grace that would come to you made careful search and inquiry. An interesting combination of words there. If you do a search on the Septuagint use of those words, and I think a couple places in the New Testament, um, they are quite often words that indicate searching extant documents. <laughs> so I'm not the only one that says this. I think the prophets were reading the prophets and trying to put things together. Seeking to know what person or time, and this is very interesting, the spirit of Christ, uh, Christ being a mediatorial title, here is the spirit of Christ uh, within them, indicating as he predicted the sufferings of Christ, and the glories to follow, which were often uh, revealed in their writings through the motif of typology. And when the New Testament comes along, when, when the Lord comes along, uh, the fulfillment, that to which the, 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 the Christological types pointed to, and then the, the, the divine commentary on the coming of Christ, the Gospels, the Book of Acts, the Epistles, and the Book of Revelation. Um, how the type functioned in light of the anti-typical fulfillment and the divine record of it 
the writings of the New Testament, how the types function becomes clearer to us, but it doesn't mean it wasn't getting through to at least some people. It, it, it means we got, you know, the mystery is now here. Uh, the, the fog is, is removed, which brings right. r- rise to a question I've had, um, you know, the knowledge of types and the consciousness of people before the incarnation, sufferings and glory of Lo- our Lord and the New Testament. You know, it's a good question. I, I don't know exactly how to answer it. Did they have to have the knowledge that these uh, of these types? Um, you know, today we have true believers that believe the Trinity, but aren't necessarily able to articulate it clearly. They should just, you know, repeat the words of the doxology and the glory of Patri and just say, leave it at that. But, but does that mean they're not saved because they don't understand the significance of the New Testament's clear teaching on the doctrine of the Trinity, or at least they can't under, they can't articulate it. So that's kind of the way I go back to the Old Testament era when people ask, well, did they understand it as a type? I'm not so sure it's necessary to say, well, yeah, all the elect understood, uh, elect believers understood all the typology of the Old Testament. I think that, I think it's safe. You you make a good point of we should not over um, overstate the knowledge of Old Testament believers but we do have biblical data to state the knowledge of Old Testament believers. So for example, we're told that Abraham knew that there was a, a heavenly country. He knew that there was an inheritance greater than Canaan. Um, we're also told that the they did. And, and the prophets that you just mentioned, they knew there is one to come. Um, you know, Because from Genesis 3.15 onward, they know God has promised the undoing of the curse. They know from Genesis 12, God has promised a blessing for the nations from us, from the Jews according to the flesh. So they they have a sense of that future, that like you said, that eschatological hope. Uh, and the scriptures assure us of that. They they tell us of that. And you know, Jesus says, if you believed Moses, you would believe me. Uh, and so Christ is there, and those who there were people who understood it sufficiently. But we have the post-mystery knowledge of it, and they had the mystery knowledge of it. Uh, their knowledge was mysterious. Their faith was mysterious. Ours is not. Uh, and I think that's a sufficient way to state it without trying to specify uh, sort of the quantitative knowledge of Old Testament saints. Quantitatively, it was far inferior to ours uh, in many ways, but qualitatively, it's the same object of faith, correct, and so therefore the same salvation. Interesting about you know the object of faith that Christ has prom- promised. Uh, Christ has promised the content of their faith in terms of eschatological hope according to Hebrews 11 there's two or three or four folks there that are listed that had an eschatological hope that didn't exclusively terminate on the first coming of our Lord it would be new heavens new earth kind of thing which is very interesting because here we had people without the New Testament, without the incarnation, sufferings, and glory of Christ that were looking beyond the promise terminating in the incarnation to an eschatological hope beyond that, which is fascinating. That, that puts some meat you know, to, on the bones of, their, of their, the content of their, their faith, included more than just... Um, you know, bare minimum kind of stuff. Unless you disagree with the, the writer of the Hebrews, who we all know is Paul. Yeah, he was Paul. I agree. So it this is kind of, I'm joking, sort of teasing here, but in the Reform Forum, one of the episodes, they talked about how different biblical authors speak of typology in different ways. And that, that's true. But they mention, you know, Paul speaks about typology here. And then they say, the writer to the Hebrews talks about it differently over here. And I was thinking, but that's the same person. <laughs> yeah, read the Belgic Confession. Isn't it the Belgic Confession? List Paul as the author of Hebrews. One of them does. Anyway. So one, um, one, one part of the both of our confessions that gets brought up frequently in this discussion is uh, chapter 8, paragraph 6. 
says, although the work of redemption was not actually wrought by Christ till after his incarnation, yet the virtue, efficacy, and benefits thereof were communicated unto the elect in all ages successively from the beginning of the world, in and by those, type, uh, those promises, types, and sacrifices wherein he was revealed and signified to be the seed of the woman which should bruise the serpent's head, and the lamb slain from the beginning of the world, being yesterday and today the same and forever. So the, the question that uh, arises with this is, is they feel that um, that view necessitates their understanding of covenant theology, that you must say that the old covenant is the covenant of grace. And if you can't, if you don't say that, you can't affirm 8.6. So briefly before diving into that, part of, part of the issue that I've seen, there's a little bit of nebulous um, discussion of, of what communicated means. So R. Scott Clark wrote a series of posts or a long post on this and, and did not accurately represent our view. And each of you wrote responses to that a few years ago. Um, the, um, what is, what is the definition of communicated there, Sam? I think you, you, you gave me the, did you stick the Oxford English dictionary definition in there? So what does the Oxford English dictionary define communicated as? Among the, the various definitions, one of the ones that's contemporary to that time uh, and certainly pertinent to these kinds of semantic contexts is to impart, to transmit, or to give a share of. To communicate is to impart, to transmit, or to give a share of. It has other senses in other contexts, but in that time and in these types of semantic contexts, this is uh, the meaning, G giving someone something, getting something to someone. And specifically here, if we look at the, the language here, if we've got to be careful, the language here is saying, well, what is it that is imparted, transmitted, or given? It is the virtue, efficacy, and benefits of Christ's work of redemption. Those things are imparted to the elect through these means. So if, if uh, a lot of emphasis here is, is on the sacrifices, but if we set that aside for a moment and, and remove that, the, the statement reads, um, the benefit thereof were imparted to the elect in all ages successively from the beginning of the world in those promises wherein he was revealed to be the seed which should bruise the serpent's head, being the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if we isolate it and look at it like that, it's not saying anything different from what we read in chapter 20, paragraph 1, for instance that uh, the promise of Christ is the effectual means of salvation. Um, so there's nothing there that should present any confusion as to, as to how we could affirm that. Um, the question then gets on to uh, how do types and sacrifices relate? How do they communicate those benefits of Christ to the elect in the Old Testament? Right, so this is where the entire discussion has been driving, and I believe that this is um, what essentially is where the disagreement is located, and where I believe, in a sense, the, I don't want to call it the battle, but the, the discussion needs to take place, is two-level typology or two-tier typology and the communication of Christ's grace uh, prior to Christ's coming. Um, so, and, and I understand, I understand the question that, um, Camden asked a few times, how does a commitment to 8.6 not entail necessarily a commitment to what we might call Westminster federalism or, um, sort of the majority view of reformed covenant theology? How does this not commit you to say that the old covenant is an administration of the covenant of grace? And here is where we need to do a better job of explaining our position, but also there needs to be better work done in historical theology uh, to understand the positions that have been held even within the Reformed camp uh, on these matters. So bear with me as I uh, explain this as best as I can. So when we, when, when we say that the grace of Christ is communicated through promises, types, uh, and sacrifices, uh, we, we really mean that it is through the promises made known 
prior to Christ and through the, the revelation of Christ in types and in, the, in particular in the sacrifices, those are the means by which Old Testament saints knew uh, the promise of the gospel and believed the promise of the gospel and received the grace of Christ promised uh, yet to come. So the grace of Christ is communicated to them. It is imparted to them. It is, they are given a share and portion of it through seeing uh, Jesus Christ to come, Jesus Christ incarnandus, to be incarnate uh, ahead of them. Now, someone would say, well, that's, that requires then a Westminster understanding of, of uh, covenant theology, because that means that the old covenant was an administration of the covenant of grace. But this is where we have to respond and say that the language of administration is insufficient to properly communicate the nuances of the biblical data on this, uh, on, the, on this question, because it's true. And we should not deny that the Old Testament uh, ordinances are, in this sense, administering, communicating, imparting, conferring uh, the grace of Jesus Christ to the faith of the elect in all ages. And, and someone would say, well, you've just given everything away, but that's not true. Because we, we have already stated that because of two-tier typology, it is not the sacrifice in and of itself. It is not the type in and of itself that communicates this, but rather the type in and of itself gives communicates a different grace, a different blessing. We said, for example, that the animal sacrifices purify the flesh. So a type, such as an animal sacrifice, communicates two different graces— God's free remission of sins in purifying the flesh of an Israelite, that's what it does, and that's what it is. And in itself, that's all it does. But it administers or communicates the grace of Christ insofar as it points you above and beyond itself to something other and greater, namely Christ's sacrifice, Christ's blood, and the perfect and eternal remission of sins that one obtains in him. And so the grace of Christ is administered or communicated through those things, but only secondarily, and only for those who see beyond the type by faith. Whereas everyone who participates in the type in its original context, they, re they receive the remission of sins, the purification of their flesh. But for some, as, as Dr. Barcelos mentioned earlier, for some of the Israelites, they saw beyond it. They saw above it. They saw what was other and greater in the sacrifices, namely Jesus Christ, not in a non-mysterious way. It was still through mystery. It was still veiled. It was still incomplete. It was still partial, obscure, and dark, and all, the, all these things, but it was true. And so just because something is subservient to the covenant of grace, just because something is typical of the covenant of grace, it does not mean that that thing, the, the type, is the reality itself. It's pointing to the reality it is its own historical reality pointing on to, to something else. And so when we talk about the Old Covenant or the subservient covenant, we're talking about the land of Canaan for the, the natural offspring of Abraham who must maintain their purity and holiness to live within that land. And they have a sacrificial system to forgive them and keep them in that land. And that's as far as the Old Covenant went. And that's what the Old Covenant did. Now, this, of course, was typical of and therefore subservient to the covenant of grace and made it known to the faith of the elect uh, from its institution onward. So just this is this is why the language of administration is is insufficient. It's nebulous. It, it does mm -hmm. not distinguish the two tiers, the 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 typological or the typical and the antitypical levels of Old Testament symbolism. Administration just doesn't get that specific. And so I'm happy to say that the old covenant administered the grace of the new covenant. And yet right, I'm also right. happy to say that the old covenant is different in substance from the new covenant. And it's two-tier typology that does this, which I base on the author to the Hebrews and all the other arguments that the blood of goats and bulls purifies the flesh. And therefore it cannot be the blood of Christ and it is not the promise of the old covenant or the, the remission that Jesus gives is not the promise of the old covenant. Whereas the blood of Jesus Christ perfects the conscience, brings us into the heavenly holy of holies, and is the, the better promise of the new covenant, which is distinct, therefore, in substance. So two-tier typology explains communication and administration, and why we can affirm 8.6, that the grace of Christ, the work of re redemption, is brought to the faith of the elect in and by uh, 
the promises, types, and sacrifices of the Old Testament. And I'm even willing to affirm uh, the language of administration. I just think the language of administration is unhelpful and for too long has been unhelpful and is used as a, a coat that is too broad and covers too much. It's not specific enough. Um, but this is where the misunderstanding takes place. You mentioned um, the, the, you could say that the Old Covenant administered the grace of the New Covenant, yet they differ in substance. How do we determine or define the substance of a covenant? What does that mean? The benefits that a covenant gives or offers, uh, I mean, the language of substance is what, what makes a thing a thing or what it is in itself. The essence. Um, and so, yeah, the, the essence, substance would be slightly just distinguished in, in terms, but what it is and what it grants, you know what it is based on what it grants. And the old covenant purifies the flesh. It doesn't purify the conscience. So therefore, because it has an inferior promise and an other promise, a different promise from that of the new covenant, it cannot be the same for substance. And the fact that the, the grace of Christ is presented to the faith of believers secondarily through typology in the old covenant still doesn't make the old covenant the new covenant. It just means that it's a type of the new covenant and that the grace of Christ is made known there. And so in the old covenant, you have those two levels present. They're both there, but our Presbyterian brothers, our Pado baptist dear Reformed brethren, are skipping over the first level. They're skipping over the earthly level. They're skipping over the purification of the flesh, the remission of sins through animal blood, the outward ceremonial holiness. They're skipping over the promise of the old covenant. And because this, they see the grace of Christ there, they're concluding too quickly and flattening mm -hmm. out uh, the, the discontinuity between the covenants. And one of my criticisms is that this is often done because of a systematic necessity. It's necessary to, to maintain the system. And older writers acknowledged this. So if you go back to John Ball, if you go back to Anthony Burgess, if you go back to Stephen Marshall, they will say uh, again and again, so long as the grace of Christ is coming through those Old Testament ordinances, it is the same covenant. For them, that's it. Whereas we would say you're, you're skipping over the blessings and benefits of the Old Covenant, which are distinct but typological of, typical of the New Covenant uh, blessings. And so we're not denying the grace of the, of the new covenant present in the old, but we are distinguishing the grace of the new covenant from the grace of the old. To have my flesh purified and my sins remitted in the land of Canaan is a grace. It is a benefit and a blessing from God. But the writer to the Hebrews says, that's, that's not it. And if you go back to those sacrifices for that remission, then you're saying Jesus hasn't come. You're saying that Jesus was not the Christ. Uh, and that's, that's why a return to the old is not just returning to an old form of the same thing. It's returning to something else that was preparatory and provisional and not the reality. The, the shadow substance language is informative because my shadow is not me, but it tells you about me. With trigonometry, you could determine my height. Uh, from my, sh my shadow, you could possibly discern my gender. That would be okay. It's okay to do that. Uh, you, you would discern all kinds of things. Okay, this person's about this height. This seems to be a man. Uh, you could know certain things about me from my shadow but you couldn't speak to my shadow. You couldn't talk to my shadow. You couldn't see a face in my shadow. And so the remission of sins, the purification of the flesh from animal blood, it tells you about Christ, but it's not Christ. It portrays Christ, but it's not Christ. And so the old covenant and all of its typology does the same thing. And that's why I, I'm happy to use the language of administration, but I don't think it's helpful. Or maybe I should say I'm not happy to use it, but I'm, I'm, I can really? use it, but I choose not to. So they. Um... To, to maybe paraphrase or, or, or resummarize a little bit. So they would say that um, the, the Old Covenant was a means or occasion upon which the benefits of Christ were conferred or imparted to Old Testament saints in the sense that the sacrificial system, as we explained, illustrates Christ, um, builds upon the promise by the Spirit that's made effectual for their, their salvation. They would say, therefore, the Old Covenant promised regeneration, faith, forgiveness in Christ, all of these new covenant blessings. And we would say that's not a valid logical deduction. The one does not it's follow a non from the other. Yeah, it does not follow. We're, yeah, we're affirming so, the presence of the grace of Christ in, under the old covenant, uh, but we are distinguishing uh, the grace of Christ from the grace of animal blood. Yeah, the old covenant was not union with Christ. The new covenant is union with Christ. 
the Old Testament saints on occasion of aspects in the Old Covenant were united to Christ, made part of the New Covenant. That does not mean the Old and the New are the same covenant with the same promises. So the author right. of Hebrews says these promises are different. These promises of the New Covenant are better. And, uh, our, and our, our brother... Go ahead. I was just going to add that one of the questions that was asked on the Reformed Forum relative to this was, if, if an Old Testament Jew believes... Looks, looks forward to Christ and apprehends him by faith, why would they continue to participate in the shadow? If the shadow is just a, a bare form for them, well, it's because it's not just a bare form. It does purify your flesh. Uh, not only has God commanded you to do these things and you have to live according to his commands, but you're, you're failing to acknowledge the grace, the benefits, the, the historical reality of what the Old Covenant did. So even though, even though your sins are forgiven by the blood of Christ in the Old Testament, you still need to be to be restored to ceremonial purity to live in the land. Uh, you still need to participate in the sacrificial system, not to mention the fact that to divorce yourself from that system would be to divorce yourself from all of the typology and the revelation by which you know and by which your faith is strengthened relative to Jesus Christ. So it would be absurd to for an Old Testament Jew to regard himself as an, an enlightened person and abstract or detach himself from the old covenant, how else are you going to have the grace of Christ communicated to you and administered to you? It's through those things, but secondarily. Yeah, and along those lines, um, uh, when kind of closed with uh, a, a quote from Richard Gaffin, um, well, how, how, do, how should they understand Jeremiah 31, Hebrews 8, if, and I, I misunderstood when initially, so when he started the podcast, he said, what are the things that are new about the New Covenant? And he mentioned regeneration. Um, I thought he meant, therefore, regeneration was a new benefit of the New Covenant. Um, emailing with him a little bit, that's not what he meant. Uh, he meant that uh, the Old Covenant also promised regeneration. Uh, it, was, it was equally a benefit of both covenants. So then how do they understand that language? And he said Richard Gaffin explained that it the author the Jeremiah and the author of Hebrews are um, referring to a historia salutis change in ordo salutis language. So they are simply referring to the fact that Christ came and secured these benefits. Not that these benefits are new, but that Christ has now secured them. But they use the language of Ordo Salutis to communicate that. Do you have any comments on that idea? I think it's a much more detailed discussion than what we have time to go through here. Um, however, I, I will, I'm going to assert but not really argue that I believe that Jeremiah 31 does contrast the Old and New Covenants as differing in substance and providing different graces in and of themselves that the Old Covenant does not purify the heart, that the Old Covenant does not give the law inwardly, that the Old Covenant does not take away sins uh, as the New Covenant does. Only the New Covenant perfects the conscience, perfects the soul, eventually perfects the body. Uh, only the New Covenant does this. And the Old Covenant is not just um, a lesser form of the same thing. It is a, a, an altogether different thing that is subservient to and preparatory for the reality itself. Uh, so I would regard Jeremiah 31 as absolutely saying what the old covenant could not do and has not done and will not do, the new covenant will provide. It will forgive your sins. It will bring you everlasting forgiveness and make you right with God. Um, that the reality is coming. The days are coming. God will do this. So again, I'm asserting more than arguing, but I would I would strongly disagree and see because of the Hebrews argument of animal blood and Jesus blood, giving different kinds of remission, I would see the Old and New Covenants as giving different kinds of remission, and therefore differing in substance. But Sam, that, that's not the same as saying, therefore, until the New Covenant was historically inaugurated by the incarnation, sufferings, and glory of Christ, or the blood of Christ, no one before that time enjoyed union with Christ and benefits. Um, and I think 
I knew you'd agree with that, but I, I think the New Testament in some, at least one obscure place, lends credence to that. In 2 Timothy 3.15, we read this, and that from childhood, you have known the sacred writings, which I take to be the sacred writings of the Old Testament, which are able to give you the wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So it seems there that the Old Testament, prior to Christ's witness about himself in relation to the Old Testament, and certainly prior to the writing of the New Testament, was able, you could say, would have to be enabled by God, to give wisdom that leads to salvation through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. So it seems that uh, this would be the experience of Christ and his benefits um, brought to people during the Old Testament era through the now, through the sacred writings, which would mean that the that Christ and the benefits were available to people before Christ procured the benefits. Uh, Brandon, you know that statement. I think it's in. Calvin's commentary on is it Hebrews 10 where he he basically says that Moses was the minister of the old covenant but recipient of the grace of the new or something like that uh hey, Augustine oh uh, Calvin makes a similar it. statement oh dear. he puts either he puts either Abraham or Moses uh as a recipient of the grace of uh, yeah, of the new covenant. Yes. So yeah. let me see if I've got it here. Uh, oh, I have a second. You got it from that dissertation. There we go. There Augustine, we go. Augustine and the new covenant. Uh, I actually found this one just uh, from from Calvin, just reading reading his commentary on Hebrews eight, but. Um, uh, he, he, he says, whatever spiritual gifts the fathers obtained, um, they were accidental as it were to their age, for it was necessary for them to direct their eyes to Christ in order to become possessed of them. There is yet no reason why God should not have extended the grace of the new covenant to the fathers. This is the true solution of the question. So he was trying to wrestle with, with Hebrews um 810 which talks about uh, i will put my law in their minds i'll write it in their hearts i will be the god and they should be my people and and talking about uh the, the spirit being poured out and he was trying to say well maybe it's uh maybe it's referring to just a greater blessing of the spirit referring to greater faith more faith and he says well wait a minute is my faith greater than abraham's that doesn't really make sense he's he's the exemplar of faith he, he's got more faith than i had so that can't be what it means and so that, that's when he says this, that the, the real solution to what this is saying is that all those Old Testament saints received these benefits in the New Covenant. And um, he, he makes a comment uh, in, his, in his institutes uh, about Augustine on this point. And Augustine says something similar. He says, um, uh, the happy persons who even in that early age were by the grace of God taught to understand the distinction now set forth, were thereby made the children of promise and were accounted in the secret purposes of God as heirs of the New Testament, although they continued with perfect fitness to administer the Old Testament to the ancient people of God. Um, and he's got a lot more statements along those lines. But yeah, Jeremiah Moon's um, dissertation on, on Augustine's Jeremiah 31 and Augustinian reading, something like that is, is really good. Um, Sam, do you have, uh, do you want to close maybe with some, uh, historical theology comments? Sure. I think that that would be helpful to show preceding arguments, arguments from history that make the same points, especially about what I call two tier typology, uh, and the nature of the subservient covenant or the old covenant subservient to the covenant of grace. And so <clears throat> John Cameron uh, in 1608, he defended many theses about his threefold covenant scheme, uh, 
or model in, in Heidelberg, and they were published in Latin, and then they were later translated and, and published in, in English. And Cameron, uh, he proposed uh, the three covenant model in terms of the covenant of nature with Adam, uh, the subservient covenant with the Israelites, and the covenant of grace. But what one of the things that he did that was really important is his in his discussion of typology among his theses, he said, this is Cameron speaking, he said, the sacrifices, sacraments, and ceremonies of the ancients had their carnal use over and besides the spiritual signification. There's your two levels. They have a carnal use. They, they do something for the flesh over and besides also having a spiritual signification. They point to something greater and other than themselves. And then he gives examples. He says, so circumcision primarily, again, I'm quoting him, did separate between the seed of Abraham and the rest of the nations. It did seal unto them the earthly promise. Secondarily, it did signify out sanctification. So he's saying, according to the flesh, circumcision marks an earthly people and says, Canaan belongs to you. Secondarily, he's saying it's pointing out an inward holiness. It's, it's a symbol of inward holiness. He says, in like manner, the Passover primarily signifies the passing over of the destroying angel. Secondarily, Christ. So also the sacrifices and the cleansings, they represented primarily a certain carnal holiness. Secondarily, they figured out Christ and the benefits of the new covenant. So, for John Cameron, he acknowledges two levels, a certain carnal use or a certain carnal holiness that is prim primary and then secondarily pointing out Christ and the benefits of the new covenant. And this two-tier typology is why he looks at the old covenant, the, the, the Mosaic covenant specifically, and he calls it a subservient covenant. It provides different blessings from the new covenant or from the covenant of grace, but it subserves it. It, for, for Cameron, it revives the, the curse of the, of, the, of the Adamic covenant in certain ways. It's not the Adamic covenant, but it, it, it makes it known again. And it prepares sinners. It points them. It pushes them uh, to the covenant of grace and the benefits of Christ. But the, the two-tier typology is the main thing that I want to point out. The carnal use over and besides the spiritual signification. Now, this model was adopted by many of the Congregationalists, especially. So Samuel Bolton... Real, yeah, sorry, go real ahead. Quick, real quick before you jump in there, I want to note that the, the OPC report on republication does helpfully acknowledge that statement from Cameron. Um, it does quote it, and it says, look, this is different from what's put forward in the Westminster Standards um, in terms of their, their whole model and understanding. So I was very thankful for that. Um, but I... I um, I want to note that from our perspective, the OPC report on republication was very helpful. I think it's a great document. I read it through a few times. Uh, but it was helpful in clarifying that the subservient covenant view is contrary to the Westminster standards, um, as well as some modern formulations of it by, by Presbyterians. Um, I did not think that it sufficiently engaged the subservient covenant view uh, biblically to determine which which was correct. It, it did so sufficiently to show that it was not compatible with the Westminster standards, but from our perspective, there's there's a ton that it, it did not touch on, it didn't address, and I don't feel that it adequately addresses our position. Of course, it has a limited scope and, and purpose. But. Cer certainly. I just, um, uh, you know, Dr. Wynn mentioned that as, it, you know, it's it's not the end-all be-all on this discussion is, is my sure. point. It's it's very helpful. It has a place. It's It's very helpful, but uh, there's more to be said and discussed. So Cameron's view uh, finds a home, especially among the Congregationalists. Bolton translated his theses and republished them uh, in in English, and Bolton just just takes his view. Bolton uh, follows Cameron, but I want to quote from Thomas Goodwin, uh, who also names Cameron uh, and follows his view of the subservient covenant and uses two tier typology. So Cameron says that the Mosaic Covenant was a subservient covenant to the gospel, and then he says, as learned Cameron calls it. And he goes on to say that the Mosaic Covenant had quote, was, was, quote, an outward covenant with the Jews. And he says that their ordinances, quote, besides their spiritual use in typifying things heavenly to spiritual believers then, they had an outward carnal use to the whole nation. So the entire nation of the Jews has an outward carnal use in the subservient old covenant. 
but then there are also spiritual believers among them, and these ordinances have a spiritual use typifying things heavenly. And you might say, well, what, what does that mean? Later he says that the forgiveness provided by the sacrificial system was, quote, a forgiveness of reprieval, not to be destroyed for their sin. And then he says, quote, and so they had a sanctification and a justification which were not really such, that is, not of the heart and conscience. So when you use the sacrificial system, it will declare you, uh, you are now just according to the law and you are now holy according to the law. But he says, but that's not the sanctification and the justification that we have of the heart and the conscience through Jesus Christ and the new covenant or the covenant of grace. So he's acknowledging the two levels that the old covenant effected something different than what the new covenant effected, but they're related through typology. It's not that the blessings of the new covenant are absent. They're just distinct from the blessings of the old covenant. So Cameron and Goodwin, uh, and of course, John Owen follows this model. Owen does not name Cameron. He does not say that he's following Cameron, but he very much uh, expresses the same model. And, and Owen was discussed briefly uh, by the Reformed Forum, and, and they do acknowledge that his view is, is different from what they, they believe. And I just want to point out that, that Owen makes this two-tier distinction. He says, for example, that all the Levitical services and ordinances were in themselves carnal and had carnal ends assigned unto them and had only an obscure representation of things spiritual and eternal. So the, Le the Levitical system is for the flesh, and it accomplishes things according to the flesh but it is spiritually significant obscurely uh, of eternal things. And then he also says, there were some lines and shadows to represent the body, but the body itself was not there. There was something above them and beyond them which they reached not unto. The old covenant could not do what Jesus Christ did. And then another example of a Presbyterian, uh, John Brinsley, uh, who was a, a minister in the 17th century. Go ahead, Brandon. Oh, no, just scratching. Oh, I'm sorry. Sorry. Uh, John Brinsley was a Presbyterian, and I'm not saying that he followed Cameron's model. I'm not saying that he adopted Cameron's model. I'm just going to give an example of, of one who also acknowledged the two-tier nature of typology. And I have a really long quote, but I'm not going to read uh, the whole thing uh, because that would just be boring for people to listen to. But he talks. he's asking the question, how can the sacrifices make an atonement? How can the sacrifices expiate the people? Uh, how, how could they do this? And then he makes a distinction between a twofold guilt. There's a ceremonial guilt against the law, and then there is a moral guilt for, in, the, in the conscience. There's an outward guilt and an inward guilt. And he says that the sacrifices, uh, they expiated ceremonially. He says they extended only to a ceremonial and temporal expiation, and that only of some sins. But the sacrifice of Christ extends to a real eternal expiation and that of all sins. So Brinsley is noting that the sacrifices are a type of Christ, but they effect and accomplish a different kind of forgiveness for different kinds of infractions. The law condemns these, this outward unholiness, this outward impurity, and the law provides sacrifices to restore that outward, in, that outward holiness and that outward purity. And this is what he, he comments on Hebrews chapter 9, Hebrews chapter 10, the, the statement, it is not possible that the blood of bulls and goats should take away sin. He says, yes, that's true. They could not take away the eternal guilt, but as far as external and temporal guilt, he says, it extended unto them. Uh, and so it's the same. That's what I want our Presbyterian brothers to acknowledge or deny, to affirm or deny. Did the sacrifices of the Old Testament remit sins outwardly, or remit outward sins, we might say? Was there a carnal use? Was there a carnal holiness? Was there carnal, carnal sins and carnal sacrifices? Apart from saving faith in Christ. Which are distinct in substance from that, that the were grace. Efficacious, that were efficacious apart from saving faith in Christ, whether the participant had saving faith in Christ or not. Correct. As Thomas Goodwin said, it was effective to, to all the Israelites and then it had a spiritual significance above and beyond or beside um, its initial historical sig significance. That is what I want Presbyterian brethren to either affirm or deny. Did the Old Covenant offer a remission to all who participated in it rightly, according to the law, 
uh, that is distinct in substance from the remission that Jesus Christ provides. Um, and, well, I, I would love to hear them discuss that point uh, more specifically, because I think that is where the agreement and the disagreement can be made more clear, is that the two-level nature of typology in the system. And then just one last quote from a particular Baptist named Philip Carey. He says, We do indeed acknowledge the subserviency of the law to Christ and the covenant of grace, but it does not therefore follow that the law is a covenant of gospel grace. The law is not the gospel, nor the gospel the law. And therefore, though the one of them is plainly subservient to the other, yet they ought not to be mixed, blended, or confounded the one with the other, as if they were but one in the same covenant and no difference to be made between them, except in respect of different degrees of the discovery of gospel grace, as has been suggested. A subserviency in anything to promote the ends of something else does not make it to be the thing itself, the ends whereof are promoted thereby. So the subservient covenant, as Samuel Bolton said, is the resolver to all these controversies. Bolton looked at Cameron's view and he said, this is the key to all of the debates because the subservient covenant view acknowledges the old covenant is not the covenant of works, but it is a covenant of, of obedience. And it's not the covenant of grace, but it portrays and prepares one for the, for the grace of Jesus Christ and his covenant. And that is the resolution to, to all of these questions, in my opinion. Did the animal blood remit sins or not? It, it did, but not in the way that Christ's blood did. Were the Old Testament saints saved by the grace, grace of Christ? Yes, absolutely. But was there, were there other blessings and benefits that they were all in, enjoying? You know, all, all of these questions are resolved by two-tier typology and a subservient covenant view. And I would love to see, and you were right, Brandon, that the Westminster Confession has already shut the door on this question. But I would like it to be more, more widely understood and recognized that covenant theology in the Reformed tradition is broader than the Westminster Confession, and that this subservient covenant view had, had plenty of proponents and, and people who received it and accepted it and thought it was good. Uh, the Presbyterians did tend to reject it quite explicitly, uh, but the Congregationalists tended to embrace it quite explicitly. And I think that it needs, one of the reasons is not only to understand the historical theology, but because perhaps this is perception. At times, I feel like we're being painted as this is a Baptist position. This is the way that Baptists think. Uh, whereas we're speaking for myself, I'm very self-consciously following uh, Cameron and Bolton and Goodwin and Burroughs and Owen and the particular Baptists who followed the same kind of argumentation because I think it is faithful to the biblical data and that it is wise and it does indeed resolve many of these controversies. So I'd love to see our brothers affirm or deny two-tier typology. Uh, I think two-tier typology can even uh, coexist with Voss's triangle. I, I don't really, we don't have time to go into that, but I wouldn't even reject it other than to say you need to reevaluate uh, point B on the triangle, the nature of the type. Is it the heaven reality itself, uh, or is it a picture of the heaven re heavenly reality through what it is in itself, etc.? Again, we'd love to chase that rabbit, but we don't have time to do it. So that's where I see a beneficial conversation happening is about two-tier typology, the nature of the benefits of the old covenant in relation to the benefits of the new covenant. Are they the same benefits or are they distinct benefits? Uh, and whether this is helpful for moving forward, I, I believe it will be. And hopefully we can arrange some kind of, of discussion on that uh, between us. I think that'd be the most helpful thing moving forward. Um. Rich, you have any 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 other thoughts, comments? Uh, no, I'm just listening and learning. Thank you, Sam. Yeah, thank you both for your time. This is a long one here. I think we're just shy of two hours, but um, hopefully people find this helpful, and uh, hopefully we can. Um, this will help to further discussion and further our understanding of Scripture. Um. And I look forward to discussing it more with people. Let's uh, pray real quick and close us out. Uh, Father, we thank you so much for this time that we can share together here. We thank you for uh, for giving us your word, for revealing the gospel. We thank you for the work of your spirit in our minds to help us understand these things. We ask that you would humble us, um, 
uh, help us to discuss these things with our brothers, be sharpened, to offer sharpening to them, that we could be of one mind as much as possible, um, and that we would glorify you in these things. Father, we ask all this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Amen.